disclaimer, I've been at QuestDB for one week, so I still don't know enough to sell anything, so I'm not going to be selling anything. This talk, when I send the proposal, I work for a different company, and I, I also didn't want to sell anything, because basically what I want to do today is talking about working with fast data and getting analytics. And for that, I'm going to be using a lot of different open source services. Uh, the, the main one is going to be Apache Flink. I, I've never worked for Apache Flink, so if I accidentally sell you Apache Flink, good for them. But you know, it's open source, so that's cool. And the others are just, you know, just around Apache Flink. So everything I'm going to be speaking about today is open source, and it's because I really like working with data, and especially with fast data. Uh, in the past, a few years back, uh, I was working mostly with data, but in batch, because the streaming was not really a thing. I mean, we wanted to have data in real time, but it was very expensive, it was very hard. And then I started working with some things. Uh, I work with, with uh, Spark, I guess some of you, Work with Spark, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, I mean, it's quite cool, but you know, it, it was not super uh, easy to to work with it uh, back in the time. Now it's getting better. It's, it's a great piece of software. I'm not saying it isn't, but kind of. And the thing is, when working with fast data, I noticed one pattern. I was getting away from Python. When I wanted to do interesting things, if I wanted to do Hello World, oh yeah, Python is cool. You can almost even do it in Ruby. Not really, but you know, but. Uh, Python was super cool always for batch. For streaming, it was mostly a second class citizen in many, 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 many different libraries. And I've seen a lot of Python people getting away from streaming data, and even in companies like the teams for the streaming data very often are based with uh, things like Scala because, you know, no one wants to do Java. So it's like, okay, we do Scala, which is the, the next, you know, worst thing. But, uh, but in Python, for some reason, we still don't do, we do a lot of machine learning. We do a lot of, of you know, uh, exploratory analysis with, uh, with uh, Python and with Jupyter and with whatever. We do a lot of cool things, but the streaming analytics, most of the time, Python is not there, and it should be. And, and truth is, the open source projects are to blame, so no one is, is, is to blame because open source means everybody's <laughs> building the software. But the thing is, Python traditionally when it comes to performance, it's not as performant as some other things. It can be, it cannot be, but you know, bear with me here. Most of these tools are written in Java or C. So the core development team are mostly working in Java. So when they design the APIs, they design for Java and really for Python. That's, it, that's been changing. And actually Apache Flink, the, the software I want to be speaking about today, in the past few years has been investing heavily in Python. For some years, it was kind of a joke. I will, I will go to FOSDEN, to the open source conference in Brussels. I will go to the STEAM analytics room, and the people from Apache Flink will be there. And all the time, people in the room, sometimes me, were asking, hey, when is going the Python API going to support the streaming? It supports only batch for, it's like, oh yeah, it's coming. And for years, it's like, yeah, it's coming. So, so eventually, it came. It came a few years ago. It came with a lot of limitations. You could do streaming, but only for streaming files and Kafka, nothing else. You could do streaming, but without the fancy things. You could do streaming, but you couldn't really do streaming. But now we are at the time we can really say you can do pretty much anything you want to do in streaming using Python. And people like, uh, I don't know, like uh, Lyft, for example, it's like Uber in the US, or people like that are using uh, Alibaba. A lot of people are using Flink, some of them only with Python. Because yeah, they agree, it might not be as fast, you know, as working with Java at the machine level, but engineering-wise, it's much nicer. And they care about engineers. They, ca they care about having things fast and having people happy. And if we have to add a little bit of machine, that's okay, machines are cheap, and that's not really a problem today. So that's kind of the thing. You can really do cool things with streaming. Uh, but why you should, what, what to, why you want to work with streaming? Well, because uh, working with data, with streaming data, is not the same as working with batch data. If, you, if I tell you, oh, I want you to calculate uh, the average and the count of uh, some numbers, easy enough. You don't need anything streaming for that. But it's like, oh yeah, there might be many numbers. They, they don't fit in one machine. The, we are not in the 90s. We are not afraid of replicating data. Yeah, that's okay. But the data is going to be coming, like, you know, it's not static. I cannot open a file and close. And because the data is never stopping, I don't know how much I have uh, beforehand, so I don't know how many resources I will have. 
I don't know how fast it's going to be. It's going to come in from different places. We are going to be, the data is going to be coming very likely from an Internet of Things or different applications. Users are going to be coming and going all the time. The users, imagine you are monitoring the playability of a game. Uh, and you are playing, and then you're to the plane, you keep playing, but you are not sending the data. You get off the plane, you start sending data again. How do you deal with those things? In batch, you always have the whole data set. So it's very easy to give me the average or something. In a streaming, that's not easy, that's really the case. That's kind of the thing. Um, the data is not going to be constant, you get the idea. So, you know, of course I don't want just the average and the, and the count, that might be the first requirement. Once you start seeing results, you want to do other things. And on top of that, you are going to want to have monitoring, you are going to have, you want to have something which is manageable. So basically, you cannot really work with the same tool that you're using for batch, for big data. Because a streaming has some requirements, has some problems that you cannot really solve with data. So what I'm going to be talking about today is how you can build uh, a system that can help you do things like this. Uh, because sometimes also when I speak to people, it's like, I don't have a streaming analytics stolen. Well, maybe, maybe you have it. And since you didn't have the tools, you didn't know you have it. So if you have something like, I don't know, I'm going to be uh, ingesting data from sensors in a factory, you are quite clear you have a time series or real time analytics problem. But if you are a game developer, maybe you want to get in real time what users are doing to improve playability or to see which rewards are better or just to have the scoreboards. That's also a real time. You can also do that with Flink. Or if you are doing DevOps monitoring security, you want to monitor those things. You totally are relying on third party services, but you can also have your own monitoring on top. Because third party services, sometimes they don't give you what you need. And if you want to do something specific, some kind of analytics, if you have the right tools, it's not hard to do, actually. Or if maybe you are a streaming platform, you want to improve quality, you want to do recommendations. Maybe you are just an e commerce application, you want to check, I don't know, anomalies or uh, any cart abandonment. There are a lot of use cases for streaming analytics. And the Python community, traditionally, have been a bit apart from that part of the thing. Uh, am I wrong here? Are you all doing a streaming with Python as of today? Okay, how many of you? Cool. Which tools? Cool. It's, it's, it's cool. I mean, five people out of this room. So as I said, traditionally, the Python community has been away from doing streaming analytics with Python. Of course, Python community is everywhere. But you know, as you see, uh, we've been away. Um, it's because we didn't really have the right tools. Spark was actually the first piece of software that allowed me to do streaming in Python. And it was quite cool. Not super easy to use. Also, Python was not the first class citizen, but it was much better than Flink for a long time. Okay? So that's kind, of the, that's kind of the thing. So imagine you have to do an application like that. That's fine, you know, we can do it. So what, what we are going to be building today, what I'm going to be showing you how to build, you could power, uh, this is like, you know, this is just a video in case everything went wrong. But basically we are going to uh, build the infrastructure to send data from Python to some uh, string of data to, the, to work with the data and transform it in real time to detect anomalies over the, over the wire. Uh, to ingest that into a specific time series database and to put a dashboard on top. And all of this is going to be with Python, except the last part visualization, which is going to be with SQL. So that's basically what we're going to be building. And I'll start easy, I'll start sending just a few hundred events per minute, but by the end of the talk, I'll pump up the things and we'll start sending something like 100,000 events per second, something like that. 100,000 events per second is quite a bit, but you know, this is working on a cheap AWS machine actually quite cheap, uh, even if, if it says localhost, it's just a proxy. So, and yeah, I'm going to be ingesting 100,000 events per second. So you'll see this works. And the limit is, you know, eventually, if I'm not putting data, I will run out of this space, or eventually, depending on what I want to do with the data, I might be using a lot of memory and will have to think what I'm going to be to optimize, but that's kind of the idea. So, <clears throat> sorry. I want to, to be doing mostly demos, so I want to go straight away, but before I go there. The thing is, if you want to work with streaming data, you need to have a lot of, you need to worry about a lot of different things. First, you need to worry about how you're going to be ingesting the data. 
There are some tools that you can use to ingest data. Some databases are designed to ingest extra fast, but very often you want to, to have something in between there to deal with data from different places, to deal with replayability. What happens if I'm ingesting the data and I have some issues on the line and I want to replay the last hour or the last days of data, or even I want to replay to a different environment. So for those things, you can have specialized tools and I'll tell you about that. Once you ingest the data, you want to transform the data. Very likely you want to uh, augment the data. Maybe you have IPs and you want to geolocate. Maybe you have some internal IDs and you want to query some lookup table to convert into something else. Maybe you just want to filter out things that don't match whatever you want. Maybe you want to have machine learning in real time, which is how a lot of uh, ad servers work, for example, just applying uh, Flink is used, Apache Flink, in many companies to do exactly that, to, to show the ads that you are seeing on the internet in real time, milliseconds. That's kind of the idea, that's the power of Flink. So analyzing the data if you want. If you see any alert, you want to be able to react fast. When I'm speaking here about Flink, I'm speaking about near real time. So usually between ingesting something and having the actionable output, we are talking about milliseconds or a few seconds. So I don't really like to say real time because real time means different things for different people. If you are, I don't know, if you are uh, walking in a self-driving car, maybe milliseconds is not good enough. I don't know, depending on what you are doing. So near real time, what we're going to be speaking today. Once you read the data, you want to persist the data. You want to have it for later analysis. And if you don't have any cool dashboards, it's going to be uh, not that actionable because actually no one has the capacity to detect patterns or whatever in a bunch of raw data. If you have charts, you have trends, it's easier to see. So that's kind of the idea. And the cool thing is that the open source ecosystem is super cool. Kafka, you all know about that. Maybe you are not proficient in Kafka, maybe you are. Uh, yesterday was a cool talk about uh, event sourcing and Kafka. So Kafka, you know, it's a message broker. You can use Kafka to send data at any scale, at any speed, and consume data from many points to many points. So it's cool at that. You can use Kafka also for analyzing data, but it was not really the same for that. So the, an the analytics capabilities of Kafka, when you compare with something like Spark or Flink, are not good enough. But if you are doing analytics for something very simple, you, can, you could do it directly in Kafka. That wouldn't be an issue. But in that case, it's good with, with Python because Kafka, if you want to, to build something that runs directly on Kafka, you're going to be doing that in Java, not really with Python. And we're at the Python conference, so Kafka, we're going to use it only as a message broker. So I want to send messages from point A to point B in a very efficient way, and that's super cool. Now, for analyzing the data, we're going to use Apache Flink. That, as I said, it's a very, a very cool tool for doing any kind of analytics or transforming of the data in the fly, as it happens. For example, the people at Zalando, I don't know if they still do it, but a few years ago, every time you were doing an order, they were opening a, a pipeline in, in uh, Flink, and every time the, there was a change in the, I don't know, in the order, uh, it's going to, it's, it's in preparation, it's in delivery, has SIP, whatever, they, they will update the status. And they will have, in, in Flink, you can do cool things like, hey, in one week, I want to have an alert. So if the alert went in one week for that pipeline, for the particular order for the particular user, without having closed, there will be, hey, an anomaly. We've been for one week, and someone doesn't have the order at home. So something happened. And that was happening at Zalando for millions of customers every day, you know, uh, with no issues at all. Uber built their whole data uh, the, the whole big data platform at Uber, uh, it's built, they, they build it custom, but they use Flink as the core component of the system. And they are doing, they ingest over a trillion events per day at Uber. Um, with over a trillion events per day, they have Flink as the core of the machine learning platform, and not machine learning, sorry, data science platform they built for the business. So it scales as much as you want. But Flink is for processing things on the wire. So it's for streaming data, you can create windows of data. The window can be as big as you want. The larger it is, the more memory or hard drive you're going to be using. If I want to keep a status of things for one month or one week, 
it takes more resources than if I'm going to be keeping a state for 10 seconds. But that's fine, you don't have to worry about that. You only have to worry because your cluster will be bigger. But from the developer point of view, there is no difference. It's exactly the same to work with a pipeline for one user, that for a million users, exactly the same to work with a status for one week, that for two months, that for 10 seconds, exactly the same. Um, so Flink only works you know, on the fly. Then you want to persist the data. You, want, you, you might persist the data on a file system, but then, you know, the moment you persist the data on the data lake, you know it's dead. You know, no one is going to use it. They tell you, oh, data lakes are cool, and they are cool. But, you know, eh, they are difficult to work with. So if you put it on a file, you can be almost sure no one is going to be using that file ever. Uh, you can put it on a database, and you have many databases. But QuestDB, it's one which is designed specifically for time series, and it's fast. So, and it's open source, so I'm going to be using QuestDB for that. And then Grafana for doing visualization, and I'm going to be using Apache Zeppelin just for doing this interactive. So with this, I've been speaking for a while. I'm going to actually start showing you things. So what's this thing about Apache Flink? What does it look like? So in Apache Flink, you have this. Uh, you can run Apache Flink with Java, with Scala, with Go, or with Python. Uh, so the Python API, by the way, Python, Scala, and Java are supported. The other libraries are not really official. So with Python, this is what it looks like. You need to have some input and output of data. The input can be, there are a lot of connectors. There are connectors for the file system, there are connectors for Kafka, there are connectors for a uh, lot of different databases, or you can just, you know, as we are doing here, uh, for the simple example, just read data from the, uh, you know, from memory. So we are going to have this input of data, different lines of data, and this is what it looks like. You start defining your environment. Here we are saying, if we have a particular parameter, a file, we are going to be reading a CSV from the file. So this is what you will do. You have to define the connector. Can be Kafka, can be the file system, can be HDFS, can be a database, can be a DBC, can be many different things. Uh, in our case, it's like, if we don't have this, we are going to be using just the data from memory. Same thing for the output. So in Flink, the simplest pipeline is, I have an input, uh, we call it a source, and an output, we call it a sync. And the simplest pipeline is, anything that is coming in the, in the source is going to the sync. That's the very basic. In this case, we are going to be uh, also counting the words. So we define a Python function, just to split the words by spaces, and then we are just accumulating. So that's kind of how it works. If I execute this, of course I'm going just to have a very simple count of how many words I have in each of the lines, which is super basic, nothing too special, but you know, that's, um, that's about it. Is this, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, it is scrolled automatically. So I had the count, okay? So Flink gives you a lot of primitives. It gives you things like, give me the top, the maximum, the minimum, the average, do filters, do joins. You can join different, different data sources. You can window the data uh, in multiple windows. I want to have outputs every 10 seconds, but also every week. And also I want to have a session window. So I have a lot of primitives that exist already there. But if you want to do some kind of aggregation that is not supported, for example, a weighted average is not supported, you can write your own Python code. You only have to, you know, define the methods that Flink is expecting, so the same interface, but you can create your own uh, complex operators, and then you can use them uh, at everywhere. So basically here, we are creating just a very simple class to uh, create a specific operator, an accumulator, and to do uh, a weighted average, and if I execute, at some point here, I see this is giving me some output, which is what I was expecting. So nothing too fancy, but just to show you that in Python, you can actually do the things, it works. And you have two APIs in Python, the table API and the streaming API. The table API, it looks a, look, it looks a, a lot like SQL. You see here the methods, group by, select, give me the column, aliases. It's very intuitive to use. But uh, it's not as powerful. If you want to do things with windowing of data and so on, it's not as powerful. You want to do the fancy things, like you know, working with 
uh, interesting bits. You want to use something which is called the uh, streaming API, which you can do exactly the same thing. You define the connector, you define the output, but it looks more like a functional API. You see, flat map, map, key by, reduce. So same thing as select and group by, but then this gives you access to do also things like, uh, let me just show you for a second here in this, uh, one of the places I have, let me just for a second. Um, yeah, so you can do things like, well, you, could, you can define things like uh, if I have uh, overlapping windows of data and I want to keep a state on different windows and I want to have a counter and get, uh, as I told you before with Zalando, a timeout when something happened, those things you cannot easily do with the table API. They are supported on the streaming API. So depending on what you are doing, you can do one or the other. And a cool thing about uh, Flink is that it allows you actually to mix different languages. You can use uh, Python, but you can also use Java and Scala. And you can define a UDF, a, a user defined function in Python, and use it in your, in your Java code. Or you can define a user defined function in Java and use it as your Python code. And you can even do SQL. So what I want to show you first is because I don't have a lot of time. For the whole demo, I've been just sending data to Kafka. This is a very simple uh, Python script. It's just generating synthetic data into a Kafka topic. So in Kafka, we have a library, which is the Kafka client. And all I'm doing at some point here is just sending a message to a Kafka topic. Okay, so this is sending data. And the data looks like this. I've been sending for a, a while this kind of data. I've been sending here, uh, you know, data from about 50 uh, different sensors. Every second, I have a few, and that's been working for a bit. So I'm sending data with Kafka, with Kafka, sorry. And what I'm doing here with Python, but actually using SQL syntax, I'm saying I want to map a connector in which I'm going to be reading from this Kafka topic, the topic called topic name, make it a variable, it's called text. So I'm going to be reading from this topic, and this is the schema of the data. A sensor ID, a temperature, a string, whatever. Once I execute this, I can just show that actually it is there, the sensor's table. And from here, I can just use SQL, in this case just SQL, not being with Python, to see what I'm getting on the data. This is everything in the same notebook, in the same Zeppelin notebook. So this is, uh, this is by the way, this, this line, the one before, this was also SQL, just about SQL, this is still in SQL. So I'm just uh, reading the data with SQL. But I can use here, yeah, I know. So I can use here, again, a Python script in which I'm reading the same data from Python and it works without nothing special. So I can start doing interesting bits like defining an output table with the same schema. But in this case, I'm going to be connecting to Postgres. Not really to Postgres, I'm connecting to QuestDB, a time series database, but it's compatible with the Postgres protocol. So we can use the same driver. So I'm just going to be writing to an output which looks like Postgres. And here, actually, I'm doing with SQL just the writing. So I'm reading from the first table, from sensors, from the Kafka topic, and I'm just into the second table, into the uh, JDBC topic. And if I come here to the database, right now I have only 27,000 records. And if I update every little bit, you see that's growing slowly. So something I'm going to do. I'm going to change just slightly my code. I know I have to finish already, but I'm almost there. So I'm going to change slightly my code. I have here a delay in the code that I'm going to, in the code that is sending data to Kafka. So I'm going to remove the delay. Commenting out, commenting out. And now I'm going to start sending data to Kafka way faster. You can see here 
that now data is coming faster, hopefully. And if I go here to the database, I should see now every time I update, I have, you know, every second we are ingesting over 100,000 records. That's fine. You know, that's, that's happening. That's already from the database after coming from Kafka. This, are, this is running, uh, by the way, in different machines in AWS. So, you know, that's, that's working. And, you know, we have easily, we are doing this. At the same time, I'm doing something super cool that I didn't tell you yet, which is I'm creating a second table, one for anomaly detection. Because a cool thing about Flink is that it gives me access to some super cool libraries. And one I really like is the complex, oh, no, that's not the one, sorry, this is the one. Uh, here it is, this is the one. So one library I really like is the complex event uh, pattern library that allows you to detect complex patterns with SQL. This is a standard SQL. You totally, I mean, you, you might know, but the standard SQL has now an API for working with a streaming and only a few systems support it, and Flink is one of those systems. So in SQL, I'm defining a condition. I'm saying, I want to be tracking events. And if I see that I have one event called A, then between two and five events called B, and then one event called C, in which the first one has this condition, the status is error. The two to five other events, this condition, the status is not error. And the last one has this one. Within one minute, that's an anomaly. So basically I'm saying, if from the same sensor, I'm seeing an error, then from two to five known errors, and then another error in one minute, it might mean the battery is failing, something is breaking. So with this pattern uh, matching syntax, I can create conditions as complex as I want. And all I have to do, once I have this running, is just, you know, I'm just inserting data directly into the database. And this you see here is the real time uh, analytics visualization of all the anomalies we are detecting in real time. This is the uh, every five seconds, the new data we are getting, we are getting with Grafana. This is just, you know, the uh, temperature readings. And Grafana is just an open source tool connecting to any database. I know we are in the questions already. So it's just connecting to the database and just running SQL queries, configuring or even visually to have that dashboard. So that's what I wanted to show you is that you can actually do uh, cool things with Python. You can do things like working with uh, fast data, complex data, creating your custom visualizations. Here it is. Oh, okay. Creating your visualizations using directly uh, Python. You can connect with a lot of tools in the ecosystem. Once you have your analytics streaming, you can output too many different databases. You have many options for visualization. Grafana is one. Elasticsearch with Kibana will be another. But, you know, I like Grafana better because it's pure open source. But your mileage might vary. So that's kind of the plan for today. And, uh, yeah, I know I'm over, but if you have two questions now, and I'm going to be around the whole day, so thank you. So, a couple of questions. Another more one. So, let's start with the first one. How does Flink integrate with Apache Beam, if it does? Yeah, it does. Uh, Apache Beam is a cool project. It's uh, like an abstraction layer on top of different providers. And Flink is one of the uh, is the one with the best integration. So yeah, it integrates very uh, very well. And actually, behind the scenes, some of the code you see here in Python is using the Bin, the Bin API uh, as a dependency. But yeah, it integrates. If you know what it is, it integrates. Perfect. So differences between Flink and Spark streaming? Yeah, they are quite similar as of today. When Flink started, they had a new uh, they had some new ideas which was thinking what happens with data that is coming late after you already did the computation. Spark at the time couldn't do that, but Spark then so oh, this is cool. So they copied that, but then Flink copied things from Spark, so they've been improving each other in a very cool way. The main difference for me is that Flink was born for streaming. Spark was born for batch and then they are streaming. 
And you can still see from the manageability point of view, I think Flink is slightly better. But if you already know Spark, uh, there is no really difference between one and the other. I moved from Spark to Flink, and the abstractions are exactly the same. The difference is in, in the small things. And actually, for things like machine learning, Spark is still better than Flink. Flink has a machine learning library, which is not as advanced. So depending on what you are doing, you might be better with Spark than with Flink. OK, a couple yeah, of yeah. questions more. Uh, given that Flink is stateful, how, how does it handle crashes? Yeah, uh, so Flink is kept in, it, it's, it's very robust. So every time you do anything, it's persisted if, if you want. It's persisted, usually it's persisted to a RocksDB, which is a database which is built internally and is replicated. So if there is any crash in any of the workers, it can restart. So if there is a problem in the code which is crashing all the time, you will need to actually fix that. But with Flink, you can do even things like uh, take a snapshot of the pipeline. So basically what it does is like the input stop accessing data, it snaps the internal, the, the internal status of the, of the whole pipeline. Uh, then you can stop the pipeline, add a new, uh, upload a new version of your code, restart, and it's going to start exactly from the point where it stopped, even with new code. So as long as you don't add any code what is not compatible, you can upgrade without losing any state in between. So it's one of the super cool things about Flink. It really manages the internal state in a very transparent way, and you don't have to worry about that. So similar to what Airflow does, but Airflow does it as a batch, and instead Flink kind of on a more fine-grained detail. Yeah, and, and, and also it has a very interesting model for uh, dynamically allocating resources depending on which tasks are taking more time. So internally, it's rebalancing all the time. I believe Airflow is not doing that. And what about the, I mean, the data remain in the queue? There is like, I mean, if it crashes, yeah. and then it's restart with the same data that made the crash happen, I would suppose there's kind of a queue there or something. Well, if it, depending on the connector. If you're using Kafka, then, and, and you have configured uh, retention in Kafka, then you can go back. Also with Amazon Kinesis, if you have configured retention. If you are using a, an input that doesn't allow, for example, uh, UDP, and you crash, you cannot go back in UDP. So it really depends on the connector that you see in the input, how uh, not only on the type of the, of the connector, but also on the driver itself. Some connectors have the replayability in mind, some don't. So Kafka in particular is very robust for that, but some others are not as robust. So it really depends on the connector. So I, I really like Kafka integration with Fling because of that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Suppose there is a great, great a really tight connection between them. And is it possible to do distributed machine learning sending ML models? How to manage synchronization? Okay, maybe two questions. <laughs> it is possible to do machine learning, yes. You can do it just with your own model and, and using Flink. It also has now a Flink ML library, which is a power behind the scenes. A lot of the contributions are, uh, Flink was acquired, it's open source, but it was acquired by Alibaba. Alibaba are heavy users of Flink, so they bought the company that was doing Flink. They have cool libraries. Uh, the, the complex pattern library, the one I saw you, it was contributed by Alibaba. And they have also some cool ones for doing machine learning. So Alibaba is using that on their e-commerce for, for doing machine learning. As how easy it is to do, it's not super, if you want to be like super transparent, which was the second part of the question, it is not. So it is possible, it's not super easy. So that's, you know, that's the most I can say. Okay, thank <laughs> you. that was the last question and uh, thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much.